In this episode of Aspor Kirtley, we are going to talk about water indicating trees, encouraging campfires to burn out completely, axe rehafting, winter hot tent setups, the chimney effect of fire reflectors, and bow drill ember failure. Welcome, welcome to episode 58 of Ask Paul Kirtley, where I answer your questions about wilderness bushcraft, survival skills, and outdoor life. And there's been a lot of outdoor life recently. I have been running courses down here in Sussex. I've been up in the Midlands on a course myself, which is very interesting. And now I'm back down here again in Sussex. And time is passing and we've had loads of fungi out already this year it's been interesting it feels like we're getting towards autumn now just in the last week or so it's starting to feel like we're on the turn a little bit there's a there's a bit of brown edging on the birch leaves some of them are going yellow but what's been really interesting this year is it's been quite a good year for fruit so far apart from down here not so much in the way of rowan berries loads of rowan berries last year not so many this year um, but otherwise there's loads of blackberries, there's loads of just everything. Um, and again, when I was in the Midlands this last week, um, loads of Gelder Rose uh, berries, loads of apples, lots and lots of fruit on the trees, lots of fruit on the things you don't want to be eating as well, things like bryony um, in, the, in the hedgerows. But yeah, it, it's despite the fact that we had a very dry first part of the year, um, it seems like nothing's really suffered as a result and we've got another good year for fruit. What's been interesting though, what's been particularly interesting down here in Sussex where I run courses and I've been working down here every year since 2006, it's the best year I've ever seen for fungi. This, this area is not traditionally in my experience the best area for fungi. There are other places where I've worked um, not not in this locality but further afield around the uk where there have been much richer pickings on a consistent basis but here this year lots and lots of uh, boletes and related fungi so the seps or the penny buns or the porcini whatever you want to call them lots of those around boletus edulis and lots of its relatives and um, a few chanterelles not a lot but then there's also been a lot of other stuff shaggy parasols and various other things all coming out um some nice uh deceivers um amethyst deceivers in particular um various web caps and things clearly which you want to avoid but there's a lot been lots and lots out all just appearing in the last few weeks so that's been really interesting to see um, those are the sort of most notable things that I've been noticing around and about in the woods that may be a little bit different to normal. Um, hopefully you've been out and about and seeing similar things as well. Always interested to know what you've seen and clearly that's here in the UK. Um, but a lot of people who watch this are in the UK, but I hope wherever you are, there's a big audience in North America, I know, and then there are people all over the world who watch and listen to this. So I'm hoping you've had a good summer so far and that going into the autumn or the fall, if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, it's going to be interesting as well with lots of foraging, lots of fruit, um, lots of opportunities to get out camping, maybe in the, the back end of the summer in North America without so many of the biting insects as well. So lots still to go go at even though it's feeling a little bit back endish I think now and um, starting to turn a little bit I think there's still lots to go at it's by no means the end of the outdoor season and then of course we've got the winter camping to look forward to and of course those of you who are down in the southern hemisphere have got your summers uh, to look forward to before too long as well it should be starting to warm up maybe a little bit now for you guys so Anyway, without further ado, um, it is uh, towards the end of my day down here and it is drawing in a bit at night now. I mean, it's two months past the equinox. Uh, we've just had the um, eclipse in North America. That's when I'm recording this. Um, 
that's the time of year we're at and the day is significantly shorter now at the latitude that I'm at than it was a few months ago so um, <laughs> we are going to lose the light a bit here so I will crack on. Um, first question is from Twitter from Wellsby Roots, Dave Wellsby, uh, good to have you back on the show Dave and his question is hey Paul I was wondering what trees would be a good indication that there is water or a natural spring nearby. Thanks, bro. Um, said in a very English manner at the end there. Um, yeah, uh, clearly there are very localized indicators in terms of vegetation as you go from place to place, but in general terms, in the northern temperate, which I know you are, Dave, um, and a lot of people who are watching this or listening to this are, there's a couple of key species of trees, you've asked specifically about trees, that I would be looking out for that are gonna be an indicator of water, even if there's no obvious groundwater. You know, so clearly, if there's a stream or a pond, you don't need the localized vegetation to tell you that there's water there. But in terms of damp ground, in terms of trees that need consistently damp ground, or that enjoy damp ground or that can tolerate damp ground um, that are going to tell you that it's worth maybe digging down a bit to create a, a well that is going to seep full of water over a, a short period of time or a, an hour or so maybe and um, those can be really valuable because you can't find any surface water you need some water and you know there's going to be some around because you're not in a desert but where are you going to find it these are the species that i'll be looking for willows in general like to have their feet in water or in damp ground so if you can locate willows and clearly if there's any sort of undulation in the uh, in the terrain you're going to want to be heading down into the localized dips or downhill to try and increase your chances of finding water and in those places if you can locate some willows that is a good indication that that area of ground is quite damp. The other genus that I would be looking for are alders and there are European species of alders, there's North American species of alders and they all like to be in damp ground typically. So Ulnus genus or Salix genus are the ones that you want to be looking for and they're the main ones that I'd be going for. Um, if you can identify and locate alders or willows that is going to be a good indication that you've got damp ground. Good question. Not about kit. Question via Instagram. This is from Russell originally. And here's a question with a nice photo of a fire or the remnants of a fire, some nice glowing embers there. His question is, hello from Canada. My question is this, when done with my campfire, I stop feeding the fire well before I need to leave and keep an eye on it as it burns low while I pack up the rest of the camp. However, I'm often left with a rather large, averaging size of my fist, chunks of charcoal such as these, referring to his photo of course, which seem rather unwilling to get much smaller. I usually give them a thorough soaking and once I'm sure they're well out I break them into small chunks and distribute them by hand. As this is rather labour intensive I was wondering if you have a quick trick to prompt them to burn to ash completely. The photo shown was taken well over two hours after I stopped feeding my fire at Blue Lake BC last weekend. Well, Russell, originally, who knows what you're called now? Um, maybe you're still called Russell. Um, thanks for the question. And that's a good one. And I like it because you give some context and um, that I, to me, you're doing the right thing. You're doing what I teach people to do on my elementary courses, for example, think ahead, think about when you're going to leave and manage your fire accordingly. And that's always the best thing to do. And that's a way that I judge uh, how experienced people are because inexperienced people will just keep throwing stuff on the fire or they, they'll put big stuff on the fire in the morning or they'll put big stuff on the fire last thing at night, sit in front of it for a bit, 
they'll let it burn out a bit, but they'll still have half a charred log left in the morning. They haven't managed to fire, and then they're not having a fire in the morning or a very big fire in the morning, and then they're left with all of this stuff to deal with. So I like the fact that you're thinking ahead, you're thinking about when you're going to leave and how much uh, is left to be consumed and making sure it is burnt down to the minimum before you go. And that's what I would encourage anybody to do. So well done there. Yeah, you are going to get to a certain point where the rate of consumption, the rate of combustion is going to reduce. And particularly with the chunkier bits that you're left with, they're not going to burn particularly quickly. And if it's uh, hardwoods that are going to give you good embers, they're exactly the sort of woods that you'd want for roasting, the sort of woods that you'd want charcoal made out of for your barbecue, they are going to continue to give off a steady heat for some time and they will take a long time to burn down. If you've got soft woods that are of the likes of some of the pines, um, even uh, some of the spruces, even if they're relatively densely uh, grown, if they're growing in cold climates and they're quite dense, they're still going to burn down to ash much more readily than some of the, the hardwoods uh, like willow left in the round. We talked about willow in a different context a second ago, but willow is good for roasting, oaks are good for roasting, um, alders are good for smoking, for example. Those that are going to burn slowly are going to be the ones. So maybe think about what you're actually using as well in terms of the firewood you've got on the fire. I don't know what species of wood you've got there, but either way, you are going to get to a certain point where things slow down. The fire is getting smaller, the rate of combustion reduces. So yes, you are often left with a few bits uh, at the end. Um, a good soaking is important and breaking them up is important as well, because of course you can have them damp on the outside and still hot on the inside. So if you can break them down into smaller components, make sure they're well uh, wetted, well out, and then distribute. And yes, it is somewhat labor intensive, but I personally don't know of a quicker way of making absolutely sure that everything is out and cold and that everything is broken down as small as it can be. Um, the only thing I would suggest is maybe think about what species of timber you're using, because clearly, when you're roasting versus boiling, some woods are better than others. And there's a little little wren just landed on the log past me here, just beneath the bracken on the end of this log that you can't see, which is nice. That's what just distracted me. I don't know if you picked up the fluttering on the microphone perhaps, but that, that's my suggestion. So to me, I think you're 99% of the way there. There isn't really a simpler way of dealing with it or a quicker way than what you're doing with what you've got but perhaps if you're burning some really nice roasting wood that's going to last longer than some of the ones that are going to burn down to ash more readily um, that's the only thing I can think of there to add frankly. Um, axe rehafting here's a question from Andy via email and he asks hi Paul I found these Ask Paul Kirtley episodes on YouTube very helpful thank you for doing them my question, if you are out in the wild, and I'm referring more to the UK woodlands as, as that's where I'm from, if you found yourself needing to haft your axe as the existing handle broke, what kind of tree would you advise for this? Well, that's an interesting question, Andy. Um, first off, a couple of things. One is um, a lot of the axes that we use now for bushcraft um, that have seen the traditional axes or the axes that are made in a traditional or semi-traditional fashion that we find ourselves using now, uh, Gransfors Brook, Vettelings, Hultafors, those sorts of axes, they typically have American hickory handles and they are very difficult to break. So that's the first thing is that it's unlikely that you're going to break a handle. Um, I've been using Gransfors axes mainly and there's no connection between me and Gransfors other than the fact that I use their axes. I'm not sponsored by them. I've got no commercial interest. I don't even sell the axes myself on my website, on my, on my online store at Frontier Bushcraft. Um, but I use them personally. I have a whole raft of them which we use on our woodcraft, of course, um, ranging from uh, small hatchets through to full-size felling axes and everything in between. Um, and I've never ever seen one break. 
Um, and yes, we teach people how to use them uh, efficiently and with good technique, but even so, even in the learning process, I've seen knives break, I've never seen one of those axes break, and I've not known of any of them break. I've seen handles sometimes have cracks in them um, because there's been maybe a little bit of quality control issue, um, that the wood is maybe not as good as it could be, but I've not seen any break in use. So I think it's highly unlikely with that material that one's gonna break. That's the first thing. Secondly, if you're in the UK, um, you've got to ask a question of how critical is it that you're, while you're out, your ax handle, uh, wear it to break, how critical is it that you don't fix that immediately? And I would suggest that in most circumstances um, I can think of, you're, you're not going to be critically dependent upon an ax being uh, in use for the whole of your trip because you're never that far away from a road, you're never that far away um, from public transport compared to many other places in the world where you might be taking an axe with you compared to some places I've been in a boreal forest um, where an axe particularly in winter is much more critical um, an axe a lot of the time is a nice to have in a bushcraft camping situation and therefore if you were to break it my question would be why bother putting a new handle on it from a material that you could find in the woods when you could go home, order a new one um, and put it on, you, uh, you know, of, a, of as good a quality in terms of material as the one that it had originally. So th there's a very, that, that's a, some people might think that's a bit of a defeatist attitude, but it's just a pragmatic attitude of like, why do you need to be able to rehandle it in the field? Now, if we're talking about more generally, people could say, well, why do you need to do fire by friction? Why do you need to be able to forage? We've got supermarkets, et cetera. Et cetera. So I, I take the point. It's good to, to be able to do these things, even if we don't need to be able to do these things. And in which case I would be looking for a nice piece of ash, uh, common ash, not mountain ash. So Fraxinus excelsior is what you want to be looking for. And what you want to be looking for is a nice straight grained piece of ash. Now ash is uh, a wood that's quite flexible, but it's also quite tough. So it, it, will, it will take the vibrations and the stress of being an ax handle, but it's not as tough as hickory. So what you want to do is make sure that absolutely the grain is lined up with the axis of the handle. You don't want the grain at all going across the handle. You want the grain going down the handle to give it maximum strength. So that's one thing that you need to do with some ash rather than with hickory. You can get away with a little more with hickory than you can with ash. So that's what I'd be looking for. There's not much else that I would, I would, I would choose. Um, you want a nice, tough, straight grained piece of ash that you can make a handle from if you want to do that. And it's a worthwhile project to make your own axe handle. It's like making your own canoe paddle or uh, making a bow. These are good things to be able to do, definitely. Winter hot tent setup. This is from Shane Bonin. And Shane asks, Paul, love your content. Thank you for what you do for the outdoor community. What is your ideal winter hot tent setup? Well, if we're talking about proper cold weather, boreal forest, consistently sub-zero winter hot tenting, I really like the Snow Trekker tents. Um, hi to the guys at Snow Trekker. Um, again, no commercial connection there, but I just love the product. I love the tents that they make. They're really, really nice um, for that winter camping. And if you want to have an in-depth look at how we use those tents, then I would suggest you go to my blog, alpaulkirtley.co.uk, and you either look through the winter camping section, and I, I know that the, the sidebar navigation is getting a little bit busy, and it's one, gonna be one of my November, December, January, at some point in that, in, in that period where I'm not running so many outdoor programs, um, 
it's going to be a bit of a project to reorganize that uh, menu a little bit um, so that people can navigate because my blog is coming up seven years old now and there's a lot of content on there and it does need a little bit of the filing needs a little bit of tidying so you, you can look through the winter camping stuff there and there's a really nice article on uh, living in a, in a hot tent or just search in the search bar. Um, there is a search bar on my blog. Uh, I had a guy on my intermediate course a couple of weeks ago saying, oh, I can't search your blog. I'm like, well, what about the search bar? It's there um, just on the sidebar, search Paul Kirtley's blog. And if you search on how to live in a heated tent or just heated tent, you will bring that article up called how to live in a heated tent. And that's an article on my blog. But the nice thing about that article is that I have had a PDF download made of that into a nice little ebook. It's about 20 pages and that has some really nice pictures and descriptions of those winter camping setups. Um, now, if it's more of a um, sort of autumnal, spring, northern temperate situation, I really like the tent TP tents because of their steeper sided, more conical shape, plus the fact you can have a a stove in them. I'm not a huge fan of the tent TP stoves, to be honest, they're heavy. Um, I am more of a fan of the tents that come with the uh, the snow trekker tents or the likes, if you can afford it, likes of the four dog stoves, those lighter weight box stoves that you can put pots on the top of that don't weigh an absolute ton. They're my preferred stoves, but I like the uh, tent TP tents, they're very nice um, and in situations where you might get some wet precipitation um, I like them a little bit more than the A-frame te tents um, for this type of environment where I am now for example in the autumn it, you never get a lot of snow on the ground here in the south of England but you do get some cold nights um, some frosty nights even you know even right out into March early April sometimes you get sub-zero temperatures overnight it can be very damp in the morning with a heavy dew um, having a heated tent at that time of year can be absolutely fantastic you can get everything dried out um, and it gives you a nice warm space to to live in um, and that and, and you don't need to you know just from a an environmental perspective as well you know it's staying warm outdoors in February in the UK requires quite a lot of firewood even under a tarp where you've got a recirculation of warm air if you've got a canvas space around you you don't need to put in a stove where it's more efficient um, use of that fuel you don't need to burn as much firewood either so there's those advantages as well uh, of course there is an additional expense to getting that equipment as well and none of those canvas tents are really tents you can hike with because they're quite heavy um, the snow trekkers come into their own for proper winter camping in the boreal with uh, snowshoes toboggans or from a snow machine or from a, from skis and polk you could get away with it um, and the lighter the lighter tent teepees you can as well but i like the snow trekker a-frame type tents particularly in the real cold because you've got more room to hang your gear up the heat is closer down to you the, the hottest part of the tent is bigger um, whereas a conical tent the hottest part of the tent is up and away from the ground quite a long way and you can't get much clothing and equipment you can get four people in a three-person snow trekker tent with all of their gear hung up and dried by the morning um, and in the boreal at minus 30 minus 40 uh, that is um, an advantage so those setups are all on my how to live in a heated tent um, you've got both examples there of the conical type and the a-frame tents and it'll give you some idea of how we use them and, and maximize their advantages so have a look at that have a look at the download as well get the download off that page you can keep that as a little guide and i'm going to do more of those sorts of guides um, if you'd like to see more um, short guides to particular aspects of wild camping outdoor life bushcraft skills um, drop me a line um, e by email uh, paul at paulkirtley.co.uk or just in the um, comments under this uh, on my blog in particular would be useful or on youtube if you want to although i prefer the I prefer the message management system on my blog as opposed to YouTube. To be honest, it's hard to keep track of what's going on on YouTube. Things get lost there. Um, it's harder to have 
conversations there, I find. Um, maybe that's just me. But anyway, let me know if you'd like to see some short guides on um, various areas that you're interested in. Let me know and maybe I'll look at preparing a few of those over the winter. Chimney effects. And this is a follow on from uh, the, uh, the recent uh, discussion about fire reflectors. Uh, and this is from Azzy. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly there. A Z Z E. Azzy or Azzy. Um, Ahoy, Paul. At first, thank you for sharing all your knowledge about bushcraft and the outdoors. You have one of the most important YouTube channels when it comes to knowledge transfer and education in this genre. Well, thank you. I appreciate you uh, calling that out. Um, I don't have the biggest YouTube channel by a long way, but um, I hope it is good quality. And those of you that appreciate good quality um, appreciate the channel. And so thank you for that. Um, I have seen your APK episode 56 and the part with this fire reflector. I think I will do in the winter a little test setup and measure the temperature difference with and without a reflector. You made me curious. But now my question. I have heard about this chimney effect. Imagine it's wind still, then you always have the problem that the smoke blows in the face, no matter where you sit does the reflector not have the advantage of keeping the smoke away? I would be very happy about uh, an answer. Best greetings from Germany, Azzy. Okay, um, so, my experience of people with smoky fires, and my, my course assistants will back me up on this, the largest contributor to fires being smoky is bad choice of firewood. And by bad choice, um, it's, it's not a reflection on personal moral standing or anything. By bad choice, all I mean is that it, it can be wet. Um, it's either not been seasoned for long enough. I, it, it might be dead, it might be standing, but it still contains moisture. Um, because trees, when they die, they don't Im immediately go from being green and healthy to being dead and dry. That's a process that takes some time, just in the same way as if you chop down a tree and split it and put it in your fire, uh, firewood stack uh, to, to season, it takes a good while. I mean, two years, really, uh, to get it properly dry. Um, 18 months, depending exactly when you chop it down and how wet it is to start off with and the species, of course, but it takes some time to dry out. So sometimes you get people chopping dead standing down that isn't properly dry and anything that is going to be wet is going to increase the chances of smoke. Um, you just get more uh, incomplete combustion. Um, more of the heat goes into boiling the water off. It doesn't burn properly. It's smoky. And then you also have the lack of uh, convection current or uh, less convection current coming off because there's less heat and then you get more stuff floating around low down whereas when you get a, a fire that's burning well it's dry wood it's hot um, you get good flames you get less smoke you get more thermal updraft and that is a is a positive again in that you get less smoke what smoke there is gets carried up and away so um, I would say a lot of the time it's either people picking up firewood uh, with the best intention, it's dead and it's standing but it's still a bit damp, or it's from the ground, it's wet, it's been horizontal, it's had more rain or snow or sleet on it and that's penetrated in, it's damp, um, you can get stuff that's slightly rotten with quite a lot of moisture between the inner wood and the bark which is still on that bark can often be very smoky as well so choose your firewood well um, i would say that's the biggest contributor to smoky fires now is a fire reflector going to help with that um maybe maybe but is it going to be significant i i, I don't know i mean I've built um, myself and colleagues back a long time ago um, 
we'd built a sort of log cabin on a course um, similar to what the New Zealand uh, deer stalkers uh, used to build back in the day when they were dropped with a canvas uh, A-frame tent, uh, just the outer, and then they used to make it into more of a semi-permanent camp. And they would use the, the canvas tent and then they would, so we did that with some modern tarps. We did that with some students on a course a long time ago. And then what we did, what some of us did, was we built a chimney on the back of the, of the shelter in, in subsequent years. It was either a year or two later, we extended the shelter and we put um, this chimney. And the, chim the fireplace and the chimney was all made out of uh, wood, which sounds like a recipe for disaster, I know. Um, but you just need to make sure it's spaced out enough. So effectively what you had on the back of the shelter was three sides of fire reflector um, but what we found was that that was quite smoky. You didn't get a lot of draw, you know, with a chimney in a house, you need the thermal updraft to be going upwards, sucking air in and into the fire um, from elsewhere. And then the heat going up the chimney uh, to draw the smoke up and out. And the way that we got the draw was to narrow the aperture of the chimney. And the way that we did that was by creating a kind of roof inside the chimney space um, where the the aperture that the smoke had to go out was relatively narrow so we created a, a sort of uh, slanted roof within the the, the the whole chimney fireplace higher up um, and then the, the heat went up underneath this roof to a thin aperture and then you got the thermal updraft which created the draw and then you got less smoke coming out into the shelter and more going up the chimney so the point I'm making there is I, even with three sides, even with three sides of, um, of fire reflector, if you like, around the fire, it was still smoky and there wasn't a chimney effect. And only when we actually narrowed the aperture above, I've got a beetle crawling down my back if you're watching the, uh, <laughs> if you're watching the YouTube video now, it's like, I've got something, I can feel something crawling. It's a little, one of those little black beetles got down my back somehow. Um, without the without the narrowed aperture above it with a real proper chimney you didn't get a chimney effect so that's why I'm doubtful of one reflector a pace or two away from the fire on the far side of you from the fire is that going to stop you getting smoke not really the biggest factor is go is going to be the quality of the firewood and how rapidly the fire is burning now if it's if it's really died down and, there's, and it's smoldering it's going to be smoky regardless of what's around it um and that's the you know if it's wet it's going to be smoky when it's burning nicely you've got good flames the smoke is there's not going to be much smoke in the first place and that smoke is going to be carried up and away by the thermal updraft but by all means experiment with it by all means play and i'll be interested to hear uh, what your findings are in terms of uh, temperatures but make sure you record the methodology as well um, are you recording ambient temperature are you recording the temperature where you're sitting how are you recording it um, how are you making sure that the output of the fire with and we at when you measure it without the the reflector and with the reflector is constant because of course the main my argument is and, and i stand by this the main factor that's going to keep you warm is the quality of the fire the reflector on the other side is going to do little so you need to make sure the quality of the fire is consistent from one measurement to the next or else you're not comparing the same thing with the with the same thing and you're going to get a false result last one Another one from Instagram. This is from Mick and nice picture of a bow drill set. There's a couple of points I'm going to make about that bow drill set when we come on to answering your question, Mick. Um, but this is Mick's uh, question and, he, uh, and context as well. Today I tried to make fire. I took a walk and found the materials. Field maple for the drill set, 
dried grass and some sweet chestnut bark for the tinder bundle, an ash stick for the bow. I made the set and got plenty of smoke and some nice black dust, but the thin wisp of smoke in my ember just slowly disappeared each time. After several attempts, I just could not get an ember. I decided to put a spark into the dust to see if it would provide an ember. And as soon as the spark hit the dust, it burst into life. I used it and made a fire, but ultimately this was a learning failure. Ask Paul Kirtley, do you have any idea why I failed to get the ember from the use of the drill? The dust seemed fine as it burned very well and I got plenty of thick smoke during the drilling, but it was obviously not hot enough. We'll keep trying, but your thoughts would be most welcome. A bit of rain coming in. So I'll keep the answer relatively short for the sake of the camera. For the guy who asked a while ago, why is it always nice weather when I'm outdoors? It isn't. It's just that cameras and recording equipment don't do very well in the rain. So I only tend to record when it's not raining. But anyway, that's coming down quite heavy. Um, so to answer the question, um, I think it's partly to do with your set there Mick. A couple of observations. The notch is quite narrow. The notch you've carved is quite narrow. I certainly think it's less than an eighth of the circle. You could afford to make that a little bit bigger. The advantage that that's going to give you is that you'll collect more dust and you'll get more critical mass of heat if you want that you need to get that spontaneous combustion where the ember takes on a life of its own and I suspect that you didn't quite have that large enough and that you probably had quite a lot of material building up around the top of the hole that you were drilling into rather than into all of it going into the notch. So bigger notch. And the other thing is that the, the hole that you've drilled is quite close to the end of the hearthboard and that can be problematic in itself. You can have the hearthboard break and um, because there isn't enough material to keep it in good, uh, to keep it solid um, and it can break. I've seen that happen a lot when people carve it close to the edge. The other thing as well is that you look like you're pretty much drilled off the edge of the board. And I, I very much believe that some of your uh, powder, some of the dust will have been falling out the side of the board as well. So you've, you've not been getting as much dust as you would have liked in the notch. And some of it's been going out the side as well, which means that you're not getting the heat um, that you need um, concentrated enough to get the spontaneous combustion and get the ember going. Um, it doesn't sound to me like there was anything wrong with the actual hearthboard material. You're getting nice black dust, you're getting smoke and you were able to light the dust with a spark. So that to me suggests that the materials were good, but I think the execution of the, uh, the way you've drilled it into the hearth is a little bit off and I think the the notch is a little bit narrow. So those are, if you've still got that set, I would try to drill a new, um, a, a new notch as it were, try to drill in new, carve a new notch, slightly bigger than that, 45 degree angle, remember is an eighth, that isn't quite 45 degrees, you'll get more dust in there and hopefully you get the ember as a result of those tweaks and, and that will solve that, uh, that problem. Um, if you're only getting a little bit of wispy smoke when you're drilling, I think what you're saying about the wispy smoke was that it was you got the ember, got the initial parts of an ember, but when, once you'd removed it, you got a wisp of smoke and then it died out. But do make sure you're getting lots of thick, almost green, certainly cigar-like smoke coming out of the bottom of the drill consistently for a good 10 strokes before you stop drilling. Because again, the issue might just be that you weren't putting enough heat into the dust that you had collected. You're creating good dust, it's black dust, it's burning together nicely, but clearly you need to be doing that long enough to build up the heat into the pile of dust so that you get that um, spontaneous, I keep saying spontaneous combustion, that's what it is. You, you heat it for long enough that it takes on um, a life of its own. And maybe you weren't doing that either, but I suspect the, the main issue is the size of the notch and the positioning of the, of the hole that you've drilled in as well. So hopefully that helps make, let me know how you get on. Be interested to know. Um, the rain is continuing here, but that was the last question. So thank you for those questions. I will look forward to seeing you on episode 59 before too long.
I'm hoping that will be next Friday, um, provided I get the opportunity to record one in the next week. Um, I'm at the Swedish Bushcraft uh, Festival this weekend in uh, Gotera, not far from uh, Stockholm. So I'm looking forward to that. And if I see you there, fantastic. And if you're watching this and I have seen you there, fantastic. Um, that's my last event of this year that I'm doing. Um, I might be at one of the Dutch events over the winter, that remains to be seen. Um, but yeah, so if I see you there, fantastic. Uh, really honoured to have been invited back to the Bushcraft Festival in Sweden by the guys there. Looking forward to doing some fire demos, fire workshops there and catching up uh, with our good friends in Sweden. Um, this Bushcraft community is fantastic and it does in combination with the modern uh, marvels of the internet, um, as pernicious and negative as they can be in some respects, the positives are that it connects you with other like-minded people around the world um, and we can be our own little tribe of outdoors people who enjoy bushcraft wherever we are in the world and I know all of you watching this and listening to this are spread out around the globe. I can see um, where people are downloading from when I look at the, um, I look at the data of where people, I, I can't see you as individuals of course, but I do get some data from the, uh, the, where the audio files are hosted. I can see that there's a real spread of geography of where people are listening. So that's absolutely fantastic. I really appreciate it. I hope this has brought some value to your day. Um, always good to hear from people. Drop me a line with questions. Drop me a line with thoughts about some of the things that we've talked about today. Always good to hear from you on my blog page. But of course, there's the YouTube and there's the email as well that you can contact me on very easily. So as it's getting dark and it's raining, I will sign off, but I will catch you on the next episode of Ask Paul Kirtley and take care and enjoy the outdoors.